Our instructor today is Jesse Miller. Jesse has worked as a botanist and lichenologist across California and the Pacific Northwest for many years. He received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2016, where he studied the effects of habitat connectivity on grassland plant communities. He is currently a lecturer at Stanford, where he teaches ecology classes, including inquiry-based courses that engage undergraduates in real-world ecological research. Jesse's research interests include the effects of global change factors, such as altered fire regimes, on lichen and plant communities. Jesse loves sharing his passion for the natural world with others and enjoys contributing to Northern California's growing community of lichen enthusiasts. <laughs> So thank you all for being lichen enthusiasts with us today, and I will pass it off to Jesse. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all, uh, even if it's virtually seeing you. So I'll go ahead and share some slides here. So anyway, uh, yeah, I'm really excited to be here and get to talk to all of you about one of my favorite topics, which is lichens, of course. And uh, it'd be nice if we could all be out in the woods together looking, looking around at what's growing on the trees in Pepperwood. But um, on, the, on the plus side, um, at least we can uh, see photos of lichens from a wider range of habitats than we could ever see in one day in the field here. So anyway, uh, I thought I'd start by just introducing myself, but uh, Holland already basically said the basics, but I've been working professionally with lichens for 14 years now, which is kind of crazy. Um, I'm a college instructor as my uh, main job, and I do research on lichen communities and lichen ecology. Um, uh, especially over the summers. I spend a lot of time working on research projects. And I really love uh, sharing the world of lichens with uh, new lichen enthusiasts. These are some of my undergrads from a class I taught at UC Davis. And you can see we're wearing lace lichen uh, hair and beards. Lace lichen, for anyone who doesn't know, is California's state lichen. We're actually the only state with our own state lichen. Uh, so, you know, California's probably actually the most diverse place in North America for lichens. Uh, so we're really lucky living here, and Bay, the Bay Area is probably the most diverse area within California for lichens. So we're really in a tremendous part of the world for lichen diversity. It's a really great place to uh, explore lichens uh, right here in our own backyard. So anyway, I'll try to share some of what I've learned about lichens over the years with you today. Uh, of course, I'm not an all-knowing oracle, so I may not be able to answer every question, but I look forward to hearing um, uh, your questions as we go. Feel free to just put questions in the chat if anything comes up, and uh, we'll pause periodically and talk about more tangential questions, but we'll try to take the, uh, you know, kind of clarifying questions as we go. Um, so today, my plan is to just introduce lichens in general, um, a, little about, a little bit about the ecology of lichens. We'll talk about the uh, morphology or form and anatomy of lichens, uh, you know, so you know what to look at, like what are the specific things you're looking at when you try to identify a lichen. Um, then I'll go through a few groups of common California lichens to try to help you learn to recognize some of these uh, genera. Um, and then we'll do a quick a little exercise using a key to, a uh, dichotomous key to identify lichens. Um, so that hopefully you'll all be able to uh, use the key as a tool to identify lichens you encounter in the area in the future. And then at the end, we'll have uh, more time for Q&A, but we'll also take some questions uh, throughout the talk. And I just want to start out by acknowledging um, a lot of these slides I'm going to show today are my own original work. But um, I've also, uh, I'm also using some material here from some of my wonderful colleagues. Um, particularly, I'm using quite a few slides from Dr. Lolita Calabria from the Evergreen State College. Um, and also using a little bit of material from John Valella, uh, Tom Carlberg, and the Lichens of North America books. So thanks to everyone who sh shared their slides. You know, lichens are uh, symbiotic organisms. And the community of lichenologists, uh, we're also symbiotic. We all help each other out and uh, share our materials. So, 
Uh, I'll just start at the beginning. I'm assuming uh, there are probably some people here who really haven't uh, spent much time studying lichens before or, uh, you know, have very little experience with lichens. So I'll just start from the beginning and talk about what lichens are. Um, a lichen is a symbiotic relationship between at least two different organisms. And it turns out it can sometimes be more than two different organisms, um, uh, which is a kind of interesting development in uh, lichenology that's occurred recently. So what is symbiosis? Symbiosis refers to uh, life uh, living together or the intimate biological union of two different organisms. And we can find lots of different examples of symbiosis um, when we look at the natural world. And uh, this can take all kinds of different forms. Um, and symbiosis can uh, be thought of as a continuum from more parasitic interactions where just one organism benefits to mutualistic interactions where both organisms benefit. And for lichens, one thing that makes lichens um, some, some not completely unique, but somewhat unique is that uh, the lichen symbiosis involves the partners integrating into a single body. Um, and this is not the case for uh, every kind of symbiosis. Uh, you know, we can think of uh, interactions like humans and our livestock. Obviously, we don't integrate into a single body with our cows. So when you look at a lichen, you know, you wouldn't necessarily know that it's the symbiotic organism. And in fact, it took scientists a long time to figure out uh, what was really going on with lichens. Um, in the, you know, the early Western scientists originally classified lichens as algae. Then they uh, classified them as fungi. But uh, it wasn't till the 1860s that people put it together that uh, a lichen actually had a photosynthesizing partner living inside of a fungal tissue, which is of course what lichens are. So a uh, lichen is a symbiotic relationship between a fungus um, and an alga, or a fungus and a cyanobacterium, or uh, all three, fungus, uh, algae, and cyanobacteria. And uh, so here's just kind of a simplified tree of life, just showing how all these organisms are related. Um, and for anyone who's not familiar with reading these, um, each uh, branch in this tree represents a split where two different groups of organisms diverged evolutionarily. So you can see here that fungi are actually more closely related to animals than anything else. So when we look at a lichen, the bulk of the lichen tissue is actually made up of uh, fungal tissue. But then it also may contain green algae as the photosynthesizing partner or, uh, and or it may include um, cyanobacteria, uh, which um, evolved earlier than either the fungus or the green algae, we believe. So that's, so it's really interesting uh, that lichens can have these partners that are, you know, relatively distantly related, um, all living together in this very intimate lifestyle. And uh, since lichens, most, most of the tissue you're looking at when you see a lichen is the fungal tissue. So I'll just briefly talk about um, how we classify fungi and how that relates to lichens. So in the olden days, like uh, the fungal kingdom was split up into uh, five main uh, groups or phyla. This, the, it, this has been changed a little bit and it's a little bit more complicated today. But the main thing to note is that there are two big groups of fungi um, that most of us are most familiar with, the ascomycetes and the basidiomycetes. The ascomycetes include things like morel mushrooms that are probably familiar to most people here. And the basidiomycetes include uh, the guild mushrooms, what most of us think of as mushrooms, uh, you know, a lot of the things we see commonly when we're out in the woods. And I just bring this up because most of the lichens around us have an ascomycete as the primary fungal partner. Um, but basidiomycetes also play into the story. Um, and an interesting discovery, a very recent discovery, was that um, although even, even, like, even lichens that have an ascomycete as the primary partner can actually have a basidiomycete yeast or single-celled fungus uh, living inside the same lichen. So in addition to having um, the photosynthesizing partner and the ascomycete fungus partner. There may be a completely different fungus living inside a lot of lichens too. Um, this uh, discovery was published in 2016. It made the cover of science um, and it really got a lot of attention because it really shook up our notion of what lichens are. 
we sometimes talk about lichens as being miniature ecosystems. And this discovery just kind of further, um, it took us a little further into that uh, way of thinking of lichens as uh, perhaps not just a static um, organism with two different partners, but perhaps this more dynamic ecosystem with several different players. Um, and it, it gets even more common than that. I don't want to spend too long getting into the microbiology of lichens, uh, since I think it's also really interesting to talk about the big picture stuff and what we can see at a landscape scale. But um, it's just fun to know that there are really interesting discoveries that we're still uh, just, just figuring out uh, in, in this current era about what's actually going on um, at the micro level within lichens. Um, so another way to think of lichens is as a fungal lifestyle. As the lichenologist Trevor Goward has said, lichens are fungi that discovered agriculture uh, because the lichens are able to entrap the algae or cyanobacteria and uh, use the sugars that the algae produce uh, for the growth of the fungus. Uh, however, it's not just the fungus that benefits. Um, the algae is also able to grow in places where it wouldn't be able to grow otherwise, because lichens grow in almost every terrestrial habitat and some aquatic habitats too. Uh, so you can find lichens in the driest deserts on earth and you can find lichens in the wettest rainforests on earth. And um, the fungal partner or the photosynthesizing partner uh, wouldn't be able to live in many of those environments alone without this symbiotic relationship. So I think we could say lichens are probably a mutualism. Both, uh, this is something that's debated, but uh, in my opinion, I think we can see that both partners benefit from this relationship. Um, so the, and I'll move on to showing some pictures of lichens here in a minute, but just to dive in a little bit more to what's going on inside the lichen. Uh, these yellow strands here are fungal hyphae or strands of fungal tissue. So in this image, we're looking at a lichen in cross section. So if we just cut a lichen in half, uh, so you can see we have um, this kind of dense layer of fungal tissue right at the top of the lichen. We call that the cortex. Then there's the layer of uh, algae, which photosynthesizes right underneath the cortex. Then we have this loosely woven layer called the medulla in the middle of the lichen, which looks kind of like Kleenex a lot of times. And then there's another layer of dense fungal tissue called the lower cortex um, on the bottom of many lichens. Um, and then we sometimes have fruiting bodies, which are the sexual structures that produce uh, fungal spores for reproduction. Um, and I'll uh, talk more about some of these terms as we go on, but just wanted to set up the basic um, uh, picture of kind of what's going on inside a lichen. Uh, and these uh, little things that are labeled as ceridia here are vegetative propagules. Uh, so they are little pieces of lichen that rub off and can land somewhere and start a new lichen. Um, and we'll talk in more detail about these reproductive structures because being able to recognize the reproductive structures is uh, really important being able to uh, identify lichen species. Um, do we have any questions or anything I should uh, address so far? Yeah, I would say we don't have any coming in through the chat, but at this moment, if anyone has a question that you'd like to just share using your voice, um, if I can see, I can see most of you on the screen here, you could raise your hand just in front of your camera if you've got a question, um, or you could just unmute yourself and ask, and hopefully we don't get two people trying to talk at the same time. All right, it looks like no questions at this time, Jesse. Okay, yes, we're good. Oh, was that, was someone gonna say something? Maybe not. All right, well, feel free to uh, just uh, type questions in the chat if anything comes up as we go. So uh, just to recap here, a lichen is a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and algae, a fungus and cyanobacteria, or both. Uh, so let's talk just a little bit more about these photosynthesizing partners. Um, we can have either the green algal photosynthesizing partner or the cyanobacterial photosynthesizing partner. Um, and both of these partners will provide food to the lichen um, because they photosynthesize. So fungi are autotrophs like us. I mean, fungi are heterotrophs uh, just like we are. So you know, we have to go out and eat food. We can't make our own food by photosynthesizing. The same is true for fungi. So that's why um, this relationship with the algae 
uh, is so important for the fungus. But one thing that cyanobacteria do that the green algae don't do is they're able to fix atmospheric nitrogen, which means taking the nitrogen that's in the air all around us and turning it into a form that can be used um, for the, the growth of the lichen, um, which is basically uh, can have a fertilizing effect. And uh, I know some of you are surely familiar with nitrogen fixation. This is actually a really important ecological adaptation um, that makes uh, what we call cyanolichens, the lichens with cyanobacteria, uh, kind of a special group of lichens. And we'll talk a little bit more about some cyanobacteria. So we can think of lichens as uh, organisms or groups of organisms living together, but we can also think of them as miniature ecosystems. In addition to um, potentially several different partners that are actually part of the lichen symbiosis, there are a whole lot of other little organisms living in and around lichens as well. And uh, just to give a few examples, there are many tiny little insects that live in lichens, including tardigrades. Uh, well, some of these aren't insects, but invertebrates, I should say, including tardigrades, uh, mites, um, many kinds of little insects. And uh, when you put a lichen under the microscope that you bring in fresh from the field, there can actually be a lot of uh, activity of these little critters in there. Another important thing to know about lichens is uh, they're poikilohydric, which uh, I imagine many people don't know that word, they're in equilibrium with their environment. Uh, so they absorb water directly through their body surface. So uh, they basically, when it gets wet out, the lichen uh, fluffs up and starts photosynthesizing. Um, and then when conditions become drier, the lichen dries out completely and shuts down its metabolism and uh, just goes dormant until it gets wet again. And uh, one important thing to know is the same lichen can look completely different when it's wet and when it's dry. So this, is, this photo shows lungwort, Loberia pulmonaria. So in the top image, uh, you can see it's bright green when it's wet, but it becomes this kind of dull greenish brown when it's dry, much less distinctive and noticeable. Um, so it can be a little bit frustrating for beginners who are trying to identify lichens if you don't realize that the same lichen can have two really different appearances um, depending on conditions. And we generally think of lichens as being pretty slow growing. Um, this is somewhat variable, but this is one reason why lichens are potentially sensitive to disturbance, uh, disturbances of all kind, but especially disturbances caused by people, because it can take a while for lichens to uh, regrow if they're disturbed by human activities. And uh, one thing that I really find fascinating about lichens is their ecological importance, uh, all the roles they play in ecosystems. For one thing, lichens are a really big component of biodiversity in many different ecosystems. Uh, in some parts of the world, you will find a lot more species of lichen in a given area than you'll find species of plants. One example of this is in sagebrush country out in, uh, you know, east, east side of the Sierra, like out in Nevada, um, central Oregon. Uh, there's this rich diversity of uh, teeny tiny lichens that live on the, on the soil that we call soil crust lichens. Um, and I've done some research studying these soil crust lichens and we typically find that in an acre we might have 50 species of soil crust lichens, uh, while there might only be 10 vascular plants in that acre. You know, a sagebrush, a couple grasses, a couple forbs. Um, so they really are a huge part of biodiversity. Um, but lichens also provide habitat and food and shelter for a lot of different animals, ranging from uh, invertebrates to vertebrates, mammals, birds, um, pretty, pretty broad diversity of animals actually have some pretty important relationships with lichens. And one of the most famous examples is caribou or reindeer in the Arctic. Um, their diet is primarily made up of lichens and they uh, dig up this they dig through the snow to find these ground dwelling lichens and there's actually been research showing that the caribou can smell the lichens uh, from perhaps as far as hundreds of miles away and their migration patterns may be 
uh, responding to where the lichens are most abundant. So they undergo these long distance migrations to find the delicious lichens to eat. Um, and while of course we don't have uh, caribou or reindeer in California, we do have ungulates that eat lichens um, uh, in parts of Northern California and the Sierra Nevada. Um, Another great example is the, uh, the flying squirrels that we have in old growth forests of Northern California. Lichens make up a large part of their diet. In turn, flying squirrels are a major, part, uh, major food source for spotted owls, which are one of our most iconic uh, species of conservation concern in Northern California. So uh, lichens are actually uh, really important for supporting the continued existence of spotted owls which I think is a pretty uh, interesting fact. Um, lichens also play some other ecological roles like in nutrient cycling. In some cases, lichens may contribute a lot of the nitrogen that actually fertilizes forests and allows trees to grow. Um, and one other really neat thing about lichens is they're just really sensitive environmental indicators. So we can learn a lot about what's going on in a given environment um, just by looking at what lichens are growing in a place and how healthy they are. And I'll talk just a little bit more about that um, here in a little bit. Jesse, can I interrupt yeah, with yeah. a question really quick? Absolutely. Absolutely. So a question came in that I think is perfectly tied to the, some of the themes you were just talking about is, um, do lichens develop mycorrhizal relationships with nearby trees and plants the way fungi will? Yeah, great question. Um, I think the simple answer is no. Um, in general, lichens are pretty self-contained. So when you have a lichen growing on a tree, for the most part, it's not actually interacting with the tree as far as there, there's not actually any kind of uh, connection where, where the lichen is tapping into the tree or anything. There's actually a lot of misunderstanding about that. It's actually really common if you're reading like a gardening column, you'll, someone will write in and say, there are all these lichens all over my tree and they're killing the tree, it's terrible, what should I do? And maybe half the time the, the person writing the garden advice column knows that lichens aren't actually killing the tree. Um, there, I mean, in theory, lichens could harm a tree indirectly by like blocking the light that would be going to the leaves. Um, but they're certainly not actually like directly parasitizing the tree. Um, but you know, I think this is a case of confusing uh, correlation and causation. Uh, the tree might die the leaves fall off, there's more light available, which stimulates more lichens to grow on the bark, and then it looks like the lichens killed the tree, uh, but it didn't. But yeah, in general, we don't think of lichens as having the same kinds of mycorrhizal connections. Good, good question. And uh, this image shows a, a salamander uh, walking around on a rock that's covered in a little orange lichen called Candelariella, and it actually appears that this salamander has um, evolved to have uh, pigments that look like the candelariella lichen. And there are actually lots of cases, um, examples of this, where animals will develop lichen-like camouflage um, so that they blend in with their environment when they live in lichen-rich habitats. Just kind of a fun example of uh, how intimately woven lichens are into a lot of ecosystems. This is a slide by my uh, colleague and friend, John Valella, who's a uh, one of, the, one of the main experts on lichen-wildlife interactions um, on the West Coast. There are also a lot of uh, human cultural uses for lichens. Um, and one great example is that lichens can be used to dye fabrics. And you can actually get a wide range of uh, different colors uh, using lichen dyes. So this woman is wearing a uh, scarf and hood that are made, uh, that are dyed with lichens. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually really beautiful what you can do with lichen dyes. And there's all kinds of information out there online. Uh, there are actually Facebook groups on dyeing with lichens. So Northern California is a great place to dye with lichens because there's so, many, there's so much biomass of lichens, especially in coastal California. It's very easy to go out and just pick up some lichens off the ground and dye some fabric if that's, if that's the kind of thing you're into. So uh, enough about lichens, let's look at some lichens. So um, when you're looking at a lichen and you want to figure out what species it is, there are a few things to make note of and pay special attention to. Um, first of all, you want to note what growth form it is. And I'll talk about what the three growth forms are on the next slide. Um, it's really important to look at what color a lichen is because that can tell you a lot about what species it might be. The size is really important because lichens range from, you know, uh, microscopically small to, you know, relatively large. 
Uh, some lichens are several feet long. Um, and also the way that the lichen branches, or the, uh, what we call the branches of lichen's lobes, so the pattern and angle of the lobes, uh, the degree to which they're um, sticking onto the substrate is important, um, the way they grow, uh, so for hair-like lichens, if they're dangling and pendant versus um, growing more erect like little shrubs, um, and then also the reproductive structures um, are something to make note of too, and I'll go into more detail about uh, most of these things in the next few slides. One last thing, um, the substrate that a lichen is growing on is also really important. Um, so it's important to note if the lichen, if you found a lichen growing on a tree versus a rock versus soil, uh, because that may be important information for figuring out what it is. So we typically separate lichens into three main groups that we call growth forms. So when you find a new lichen, the first thing to do is decide which of these groups it's in. Um, and these groups are the crustose lichens. Uh, these can grow on rock or wood or soil, but these are lichens that are completely oppressed to the substrate. So they're not peeling off of the substrate at all. They're just totally stuck on there. Um, uh, the second growth form or functional group is the foliose lichens. These are the leaf-like lichens. And the main difference between these and the crustose lichens is they're not completely stuck onto the substrate. Um, wh while they're probably going to be attached somewhere, um, they can be uh, relatively loose and, you know, most of the surface may be unattached. So the foliose lichens always have a distinct top and bottom, and that's uh, the key detail. Uh, for being able to identify them. The crustose species, you're not going to be able to find a bottom surface of the lichen because it's totally stuck on whatever it's growing on. And then the third functional group is the fruticose lichens. These are the hair-like lichens. Um, so these can range from relatively small little tufts of hair to these really long pendulous lichens. This uh, photo shows Usnea longissima, which is the world's longest lichen. Uh, Usnea longissima strands can be up to six feet long or maybe even longer. Um, and that is, we do have Usnea longissima in California. You'll find it in old growth forests in Northern California. Um, one place that I've seen it recently is at Bull Creek Flats uh, in uh, Humboldt State Park uh, in Southern Humboldt County. Um, beautiful, beautiful spot. And there's uh, a bunch of uh, Usnea longissima growing uh, right by, right before you get to the parking area as you're driving in there. Um, so I'll just show a few photos to get as their photosynthesizing partner. So you can see the, uh, um, you know, lichens can come in green algal lichens, perhaps most commonly uh, will have these kind of gray green or grayish or yellow gray um, coloration, kind of dull colorations, especially when they're dry. Um, so this is Avernia prunestri, a really common lichen we get on oaks in the Bay Area. And this is Hypogymnia physodes. Uh, the Hypogymnia genus is the tube lichens, which is also pretty common in Northern California. Um, but we also have these lichens that have the cyanobacteria, which are also called blue-green algae as their photosynthesizing partner. And often the lichens with the uh, cyanobacterial partner or the blue-green algal partner will be uh, darker in color, um, often kind of blackish. So this is a leptogium, it's called. Uh, we call these jelly lichens. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And this is a lichen called uh, Pseudocephalaria crocata. That's actually, the name has changed, but uh, I won't, I won't make things too confusing. Really beautiful lichen with these little uh, chartreuse uh, reproductive, vegetative reproductive propagules on it. Um, and then we also have lichens that have uh, green algae as the main photosynthesizing partner, but also contain little pockets of cyanobacteria on the surface. Um, so this is a uh, peltigera or dog lichen. Uh, and here we have Loberia pulmonaria. This is lungwort, um, one of our most distinctive lichens in Northern California. Um, another thing to uh, pay attention to with lichens is distinguishing what we call stratified and unstratified lichens. And uh, I'll just, and so the one on the left here is stratified. Uh, the one on the right is unstratified or what we call a jelly lichen. And I'll just go on to the next slide to clarify what I mean here. So the difference is in stratified lichens, 
Um, there's just a single row of algae um, underneath the upper surface of the lichen. Um, and in unstratified lichens or gelatinous lichens, just uh, evenly spread throughout the whole lichen rather than occurring in just a single row at the top of the lichen. You can't tell this uh, from looking at the lichen from the outside, but you can learn to recognize these lichens because they have this kind of, uh, we call them jelly lichens because they do have this kind of uh, jelly-like appearance that you can learn to recognize. Do we have any, uh, any questions I should answer right now? Yeah, I see uh, lungwort is also a plant in the garden too, I think. Are they related to the lichen? Um, yeah, you know, that's the thing about common names is uh, it, it gets tricky because sometimes the same common name will be used for several different organisms. So no, they're, they're not particularly, I, and I actually can't remember what the plant lungwort is, but um, no, they're, they're going to be pretty distantly related because uh, plants, all, all lichens are pretty distantly related to all plants. But good question because that is something to keep in mind. So that's one reason why I find it really useful to pay attention to Latin names of organisms, just to be more clear about that. That said, uh, you know, Latin, Latin names change too. We, uh, scientists change their minds about how to classify organisms. So there are cases where common names are actually more stable over time. So I think the best approach is to pay attention to both the common and the Latin names. Uh, you know, uh, that reduces the risk of confusion. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, it has to do with the, you said uh, lichens contribute to the nutrient cycle, and I'm wondering how that happens since it seems like a lot of the uh, nitrogen fixing and so on is within the organism itself. And then yeah, so yeah, great question. So yeah, the nitrogen fixing um, occurs within the organism itself, mm -hmm. but the contribution to the ecosystem is when the lichen dies and decomposes, then mm -hmm. that nitrogen is recycled into the ecosystem and potentially comes available to other organisms like uh, trees, for example. Okay, and then the other question, I've always heard that lichens actually decompose rock. Which uh, yeah. Yeah, so I believe, I don't know a lot about that, but I believe that some rock dwelling lichens actually contain enzymes that kind of help them break down the rock and uh, get their fungal hyphae into there to hold on to the rock. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, I think that is true, but it's, it's very slow. It's not like, um, you know, you're going to see a rock and then a lichen shows up and then like a year later the rock <laughs> is gone. You know, right. You know, like we'd, we'd run out of rock real quick if that's what was going yeah. on. But uh, okay. yeah, Thank it's you. a very, very slow process to the extent it is happening. Yeah, great questions. Um, so I think actually I already showed what I wanted from this cross section. I put this in here just to remind you um, these different kind of layers of the lichen. So the cortex is the upper surface. Um, then we have the algal layer, the, the kind of tissue-like layer we call the med medulla, and then the lower cortex, which is another um, kind of hardened layer of fungal tissue. This will, we'll be coming back to that in a little bit. Um, so I mentioned that it's important to note uh, what substrates lichens grow on. So just to go through a few of the common substrates, uh, we get a really high diversity of lichens on rocks. Um, we also have a lot of lichens that grow on wood, um, including living trees as well as dead wood. Um, so we call these, uh, we call lichens that live on bark uh, corticulous lichens or epiphytic lichens or epiphytes. Um, there are also a lot of lichens that actually grow on soil. Um, typically in uh, more open landscapes and drier landscapes. Um, so this is uh, table rocks in Southern Oregon. Uh, perhaps some of you have been there uh, near Medford. And they're actually really diverse communities of soil dwelling lichens on the ground on the tops of table rocks. Um, and these are just a couple photos of those lichens. Um, these are not the most beginner friendly lichens because they're usually really tiny. So when you're starting out, my advice is look at lichens that grow on trees because those are usually the easiest to identify and they're some of the biggest lichens. Um, and in some cases, we actually get pretty diverse communities of lichens growing on the leaves of plants. This is typically, these typically become more abundant in the tropics, but we do sometimes see a few of these uh, in the temperate world. Uh, we also have uh, lichens that grow on uh, mosses, on cars, on fence posts, and in the right habitats on almost anything that holds still. Um, actually, long-lived tortoises will actually have lichens uh, growing on their shells. 
I believe there have also been cases of lichens growing on sloths in a rainforest. So yeah, really quite a diversity of uh, 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 things that lichens can grow on. And one, one more uh, key term for you is the term thallus. We often refer to the body of an individual lichen as a lichen thallus. So just, just so you know, you'll probably encounter that word uh, when you're trying to identify lichens. So one thing that's really important when you're learning to identify lichens, uh, one of the first steps is to uh, learn to tell lichens apart from mosses. Because lichens and mosses are, even though they're not uh, very closely related in evolutionary terms, they're ecologically pretty similar and they grow in a lot of the same habitats. Uh, so one thing that helps is to know that mosses have leaves um, and lichens never have leaves or, or, or even real stems for that matter. Lichens actually don't have any tissue differentiation, which makes them different from plants. Um, they're all just the same tissue, even if it uh, kind of changes shape a little bit. Uh, they don't actually have differentiated tissues like we do, for example. Mosses are often uh, bright greenish in color when they're wet, but not always. There are some lichens that are bright greenish in color, but usually um, more commonly lichens are other colors. Uh, so color and the presence of leaves are a couple things. Um, uh, that can help you tell them apart. So now that uh, you know that much, uh, I want to play a little game and I'm not sure if we can do this uh, easily on Zoom. So what I want to do is show you a photo of uh, something that's either a lichen or not a lichen and have you guess whether it's a lichen. So I know sometimes on Zoom there's like a thumbs up, thumbs down. Do we, do we have that here, Holland? Okay, okay, so can everyone yes. uh, take, so where, where should people look to find that? Yeah, so if you look down uh, near your Zoom controls where you found the chat icon, you will also see a reactions option. And if you click that, you'll see um, like a clapping hands, a thumbs up, a heart, some different like kind of emoji looking things. So you could do, uh, you could click the thumbs up for if it is a lichen. Alternatively, another idea is if you can't uh, find the icon, you could also type in the chat. You could say yes if you think it is a lichen. Okay. Okay. So yeah, let's say thumbs up. Uh, so there may not be a thumbs down though. Huh? I can't actually see these on my side, but uh, so maybe we can have thumbs up be yes and heart be no. Play lichen, not a lichen. All right. Uh, so I'll show a picture, I'll put a picture up, and you tell me whether you think it's showing a lichen or not. Oops. All right, how about this one? All right, some people are saying yes. Uh, I hate to break it to you, but this is not a lichen. Yeah, so this is a telephone pole with some old flyers stapled to it. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we, we have a joke that this is an urban lichen called Noticius uh, Paperus. But uh, yeah, no, this is actually not a lichen, but a great example of how you can have things that at a glance look like lichens uh, that are not in the urban environment in particular. All right, full disclosure, this photo was taken in the southeastern United States. So what do you think? Is this a lichen or not? All right, we're getting some yeses. Once again, I hate to break it to you, but this is not a lichen. Yeah, so this actually, this is a tricky one because in California, we have lichens that look almost exactly like this, but this is actually Spanish moss, which is a vascular plant in the Southeastern US. So yeah, trick, pretty, pretty tricky one, but lace lichen, our state lichen, looks a lot like this in California. All right, how about this one? Do you think this is a lichen or not? Yeah, so I'm seeing some yeses. Yeah, so this this is a lichen. Good good job, everyone. Yeah, no more, uh, not not tricking you this time. Yeah, so this is a ground dwelling lichen um, in the genus Cladonia, or also known as Cladina. All right, how about the stuff covering this car? Is that a lichen? Yeah, no, this isn't a lichen. That's that's a moss. Um, so the bright green color, and if you look closely, there'd probably be little leaves on there. 
All right, how about this stuff? Some, some have thought this might be a weird, uh, a new invasive lichen. Uh, this is actually just a toilet paper that someone put in a live oak tree. So yeah, you gotta, you gotta watch out in the urban environment. There's a lot of uh, tricky lichen lookalikes. Um, all right, how about this uh, stuff that I found on a road in uh, Ashland, Oregon? So this is actually not a lichen. This is just some kind of like goo or something. But uh, tricky, tricky example because about a foot away from the goo, I found this, which actually is a lichen. And there actually, you can actually see two species of lichens in this photo. Uh, this big gray thing is one lichen species, and then these little orange things are the fruiting body of another lichen. So this is in a city street. It's really amazing, um, just you know how lichens are almost everywhere once you start looking for them. All right. So that, thanks, thanks for playing, everyone. Uh, that's the end of our game. Uh, so I'll just um, mention a few more uh, fun ecological lichen facts, and then I'll show images of a few more lichens, um, and then we'll go on and practice uh, identifying a lichen. Um, so one other thing that's important to know about lichens is that they can be very sensitive to air pollution. This is a map showing uh, areas with high atmospheric nitrogen deposition in California. So these are the nitrogen-based chemicals that we get from car exhaust, uh, from agricultural fertilizers, uh, from industrial emissions. So you can see that uh, the Sierra Nevada, especially the foothills of the Sierra Nevada, really gets hammered with these, um, with these nitrogen-rich chemicals. The entire Central Valley um, would also be orange uh, if, if that area was included in this study. And um, then you can see that in urban areas of the state, like in the Bay Area, in the South Bay, um, and especially in the greater LA area, uh, lots and lots of nitrogen enrichment. And this has a huge effect on the lichen communities. So in places with um, really intense nitrogen enrichment, uh, we tend to get a lot of these bright yellow and orange lichens. So if you ever see a branch of a tree that looks like this, where it's just completely covered in orange lichens, you can be pretty sure you're in a place um, with substantial air pollution. And one great example is if you're ever driving through the Central Valley, like in the Sacramento area, um, if you pull over and look closely at the trees growing at the edges of the farm field, they'll often be um, covered in these orange lichens. Sometimes um, it's so intense that you can just, you can spot it at 60 miles an hour while you're driving along. Um, once you learn to recognize um, the lichens that are air pollution sensitive and the lichens that are not so air pollution sensitive, um, you can actually get something of a sense for how polluted a given place is just by what lichens are growing there. And I've actually been working on a project with uh, some of my undergraduates at Stanford where we've been collecting lichens um, uh, in the Palo Alto area on the Stanford campus and up in the foothills um, behind campus. And uh, we actually find that even within an area of a couple miles, there's a lot of variation in the amount of nitrogen in the lichens, um, indicating, you know, a pretty strong gradient of air pollution just uh, in the area between campus and the foothills, um, and then farther north where the air is much cleaner because there's coastal air coming in. Um, and when you get into places where you see these bigger lichens with more surface area, that's a sign that you're in a place with less air pollution uh, because typically lichens with a lot of surface area, um, you know, they soak up everything that's in the air and they can't really survive in places with a lot of air pollution. So in general, if there are a lot of big happy looking lichens, you're in a place with clean air. If there are a lot of small orange and gray lichens, um, you're in a place with uh, more polluted air. So when you see a scene like this, um, the beautiful uh, lace lichen, our state lichen, that's just draped from oak trees, um, you're probably in a place with pretty clean air. It also probably means you're in a place that uh, is exposed to coastal fog. Was there a question or anything there? Yeah, a couple of questions have come in. Um, one was, uh, what is this yellow lichen? Referring to the lichen that was on the, um, the example you gave of a nitrogen rich area. Yeah, that was a, uh, I believe that was a Xanthoria or a related species. Uh, so we sometimes call those sunburst lichens. We have a handful of species of Xanthoria, but they're all the exact same orange color and they're all, um, they're all species that increase um, when there's a lot of nitrogen available. Yeah, so it, basically any orange or yellow lichen um, is going to be a species that increases with air pollution. I don't know why, like evolutionary, evolutionarily why that is, but 
Uh, it just appears that almost all the orange and yellow lichens uh, seem to thrive in polluted places. And most other lichens don't, with a few exceptions. Yeah, and then a follow-up question, and this is something I've actually been wondering, is, um, is, do you know much about the recent massive amounts of smoke having an impact on lace lichen or other lichens? Yeah, great question. That's something I've wondered about too. Uh, my guess is it does not have a really strong effect on the lichens because, um, so remember how we talked about how the lichens are uh, metabolically active when it's wet out, but they become dormant when it's dry out? So all, you know, the fires always happen during the dry season, kind of, you know, by definition. So the lichens are completely dormant during this time of year. So they're probably not, they're not photosynthesizing. So they're probably not absorbing very much of uh, what's around them in the atmosphere. So my guess is the smoke, uh, you know, probably doesn't have that big an effect, even though you might expect it would since lichens are so sensitive to air pollution. But um, I'd certainly be interested to see more research on that. I don't know of any actual research on that, and I'd like to see if that's, if my hypothesis is actually true or not. Um, also, one other thing is the smoke, uh, even though it's very intense, it's relatively, usually relatively short-lasting. You know, like uh, here in San Francisco, where I live, it was only really intensely smoky for a few days or a week. Um, versus like this nitrogen air pollution is there, you know, all day, every day, uh, year in and year out. Um, so there's, you know, there's actually, it's more of a long-term thing than these short-term smoke events. But good question. I think that's something we still need to learn more about. Um, so as always, um, I'm probably, we're probably going to run out of time before I get to everything I wanted to do, but um, I think I'll just go through a few more of these anatomical features that uh, will be useful for you to know as you learn to identify lichens. Um, and I love this quote from Henry David Thoreau, I find myself inspecting little granules, as it were, on the bark of trees, little shields or apothecia springing from a thallus, such is the mood of my mind. I call it studying lichens. Yes, very, very poetic. So as I mentioned earlier, we uh, refer to the branches of lichens as lobes, and sometimes the width of a lobe is an important character um, for identifying a lichen. So this image just kind of demonstrates how you might measure the width of a lobe, uh, where those little arrows are. Um, one of the most important features to look at is uh, reproductive features. And so lichens can reproduce both sexually and asexually. Um, the asexual propagules or reproductive structures are basically just little pieces of lichens um, that rub off and can travel somewhere and grow into a new lichen. Um, and so I'll talk about two main ones, um, what we call ascidia and what we call ceridia. The only difference, so this is ascidia up here in the upper right. Um, so the ascidia contain a layer of fungal tissue that we call the cortex over them. So they look like shiny little fingers. Um, whereas the ceridia don't have the layer of cortex over them, so they look more uh, powdery or cobwebby, um, like little, little lichen dust, basically. Um, and I'll show some actual photos. These are just kind of schematic diagrams. So here are some photos of ascidia. Um, so these are just little fingers that can easily, um, if like some animal uh, bumps the lichen, these can break off. Uh, they might get caught in an animal's fur or feathers and travel somewhere and start a new lichen. Uh, and then these are what ceridia look like. So these are just little powdery patches on a lichen. Uh, and same thing, um, they may be especially adapted for animals um, that touch the lichen. A little, a little piece of the powder gets stuck to the animal and travels somewhere. Um, of course, it's not necessarily just animals spreading these around. Um, it could be that they blow around in the wind a little bit um, or move about through other means. Uh, so if you're only going to remember one vegetative structure, remember these powdery things called ceridia, um, because the presence or absence of ceridia is really useful for identifying lichens. Um, a lot of lichens have them, but a lot of lichens don't, and uh, you really narrow down your options by figuring out if they're there. Um, and the ceridia can, uh, so ceralia are, is the, the word ceralium is just the word for a patch of ceridia. Um, and they can grow on the edge of the lichen, or in the middle of the lichen, or on the tips of the lobes. And the location of the ceralia is also important in many cases. Um, and then lichens can also reproduce sexually. And when they reproduce sexually, they uh, most commonly make structures called apothecia. 
um, which are fruiting bodies of the fungal partner. So in contrast to the vegetative um, reproductive propagules, which contain both the fungal partner and the photosynthesizing partner, uh, the sexual fruiting bodies only produce fungal spores. So uh, these spores uh, will travel somewhere, they'll germinate, um, they'll grow into a fungus, and then they have to encounter the algae um, living in their environment to actually form a new lichen. So it's a slightly different process uh, for the sexual and asexual reproduction. Um, and apothecia can come in different shapes and sizes and colors. Um, on these little cladonia lichens, the apothecia are those uh, red things, uh, red globules on the tips of the lichens. Um, and this, this is an illustration showing um, just variation, different kinds of apothecia you'll see in different lichens. So again, apothecia are the sexual fruiting bodies of the fungus that produce fungal spores. Um, and this is what an apothecium looks like in cross-section. So it has these little, uh, what we can think of as spore cannons um, called assai um, that shoot spores out of them when the spores mature. Um, and this is what the spores actually look like in the assay. This is the kind of thing you have to have a microscope for, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, since I'm guessing a lot of you aren't going to be looking, uh, using a light microscope to look at lichens, although I highly recommend it if you're uh, interested. Um, and this is what the actual lichen spores look like. Again, these are microscopic, so you're not going to see them with your eyes, but they're actually very beautiful and they come in many different uh, shapes and sizes. Of course, the sizes all range from, you know, small microscopic to large microscopic. Um, any questions about the reproductive structures before I move on? Yeah, we've got a question, a couple questions related to that. Um, so first, uh, what conditions are needed for reproduction? Mm, uh, yeah, good question. So a lot of lichens um, form reproductive structures as soon as they reach um, a certain size. And continue, to and continue to continuously reproduce for the rest of their lives. Uh, so it's not like plants where they may just, you know, flower once a year. For the most part, um, you know, once lichens uh, get enough mass to uh, be able to have room for the reproductive structures, they just start reproducing. Um, and so you can go at any time of year and see reproductive structures on lichens. It's not really like a seasonal thing or anything. So basically like any conditions, um, they just, they may not do it when they're teeny tiny babies, but as soon as they get big enough, they're just going to start reproducing and keep doing it. And was there another question too? Yeah, there's actually quite a few coming through on this topic. Um, All right. So uh, does sexual reproduction of lichen produce the same species or can the new fung fungus capture other kinds of algae and then become a new lichen? Ah, very interesting question. So typically to form what we think of as a certain lichen, um, that's the combination of a single fungal species and a single algal species. Um, there are cases where the same fungus can either partner with, a green, al with green algae or with cyanobacteria and produce totally different looking lichens, um, depending on which one it partners with, even though it's the same fungus. Um, in fun fact, almost everything that, look everything that we consider a different lichen species is actually a different fungus species, but there are actually only about 50 species of algae that form lichens. So many different lichen species are actually made up of the same algae. So hopefully that kind of answers that question. Did, yeah, was that, was that the, did I miss anything? I think I got the job. Yeah, I think that was on target. Okay, a couple more questions on this topic. Um, are some lichens able to reproduce both asexually and sexually? Yeah, for sure. Yep, some are just sexual, some are just asexual, and some do both. And there are actually some lichens that don't have any specialized reproductive structures of any kind. Um, and those are often uh, fairly rare lichens. Um, these include lichens, uh, like these might be lichens that just depend upon um, kind of being like scattered about a bit during a storm um, and moving around just through the thallus breaking apart. Great, and then uh, let's see here, what was the, uh, this other question? So um, for clarification as well, does the, for asexual reproduction, the piece that breaks off, does it have both the fungal partner and the photosynthesizing partner in it? Yes, it does, yeah. Is that all for now? I think that's all for now. Okay, okay. great. 
So one more little feature that's commonly used um, to identify lichens is what we call rhizines. Um, and these are basically like little lichen roots. Uh, they, they mostly just are, uh, allow the lichen to attach to the substrate, uh, but the rhizines can actually come in different shapes and forms, um, as you can see in this image. Um, so in particular, we look at whether a rhizine is branched, and if so, the shape of the branches, and that's actually important for telling some lichens apart. Um, and this is a, these can be pretty small, so you often need to use a hand lens. In general, when you're looking at lichens, it's, um, it's a really good practice to have a hand lens with you so you can look at the small things. Um, you'll get a lot farther if you have a hand lens um, to just really zoom in on what's going on on all the different parts of the lichens. Um, and then there can also be patches of hair on a lichen surface that we call tomentum. Uh, not super common, but it can be a feature that um, you might need to know about. Um, and I'm almost, I'm not going to go too crazy with the anatomy. Um, there's, you know, there's, there are a lot of different things you can find on lichens anatomically, but uh, I'm not going to get to everything today. One other thing I will mention, though, is what we call cilia, which are basically just little hairs uh, growing out of um, different parts of the lichen, uh, most commonly on the edges of a lichen. And one of our common uh, Northern California lichens, uh, Parmatrema or ruffle lichen, is characterized by abundant cilia. You can see these little black hairs in this photo. Um, so if you see this gray lichen with the black hairs, you know you've got a Parmatrema or ruffle lichen. Um, there's another group of lichens that has little uh, white craters on the underside of it uh, called Cyphellae or Pseudocyphellae. I'm a uh, don't want to, I'm going to keep moving here, but just be aware that um, if you see what look like little tiny white moons on the underside of a lichen, that's a specialized feature that can be important to realize too. Um, and one other thing we often do to identify lichens is use what we call chemical tests um, to find out uh, about the chemistry of lichens, because sometimes two lichens can look very similar, but have chemical differences, and that can be important for telling them apart too. Um, one chemical we use is bleach, which is obviously really easy for anyone to get and use. Um, but we also use potassium hydroxide and a chemical called uh, uh, phenylene diamine, um, which is a little bit harder to get, not something you probably have around your house. Um, anyway, uh, if you ever go to like an actual in-person workshop for learning to identify lichens, you can, th these are actually quite easy to use and um, sometimes are really important for identification. Um, and professionals uh, use fancier methods like thin layer chromatography for uh, figuring out what chemicals are in lichens uh, in labs. Uh, so what I was thinking I would do now is just show a few slides of a few of our most common lichen groups that you're likely to encounter in California. Um, I think I want to take just a two minute break so people can stretch since we've already been going for an hour. And then I'll come back, uh, show a few common lichens, and then we can practice using the key if people would like to. So Jesse, during the break and in the chat, there's been some conversation about um, growing lichens, either in your garden or trying to keep some lichen alive in your home and whether or not folks have had success with that. Um, Nicole was mentioning that she's kept a lichen alive just by kind of keeping it wet and in a windowsill where it gets light. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, I haven't really played around with that too much, but, um, and you know, another thing you can do is if you, uh, like get a rock that has lichens on it. Um, you know, if you put it in the right kind of habitat in your yard, that's one way to get more lichens. Um, I've actually done, so I live in San Francisco, like a mile from Golden Gate Park, and there's a lot of lace lichen in Golden Gate Park, but um, you don't actually find it in my neighborhood. But I uh, transplanted some into my yard and it seems to be doing really well. It seems to be happy here. So some, sometimes you can transplant it and it works out. Yeah, I think it's fun to have some lichens around in general, personally. So, all right, if we're ready to continue, I was thinking I would just show a few of the most common uh, California lichens and lichen genera. Um, these are things that you're likely to encounter in your daily life around the Bay Area. Um, so sometimes it's just nice to have an idea for what some of these are when you run into them. Uh, so our first one here is Ramelinum and Zizii, or lace lichen. This is our state lichen. And it's super distinctive. It's one of the biggest and most noticeable lichens. Um, one thing that's really cool about it is it forms these fishnet-like patterns, um, or what we call reticulate pattern. Um, but it also has these broader strap-shaped lobes. So super cool stuff. Um, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with lace lichen. And feel free to continue to ask questions as we go. Another um, 
major genus of lichens in Northern California is the genus Usnia. Um, and uh, at a glance, you might think this looks kind of like lace lichen, but you'll notice that it's not doing that fishnet kind of pattern. And uh, Usnia is a big genus. We have dozens of species of Usnia, if not maybe a hundred or more in California. And one thing that's distinctive about the Usnia genus is it has this elasticy central cord uh, that's stretchy. Um, so you can kind of like break one of the branches apart and find the central cord inside any Usnia species. And Usnias are usually this kind of grayish, yellow grayish color, uh, but they are uh, on the coast, you'll sometimes see red Usnias too. Um, and they can be other colors as well. I bet, I would imagine some people here are probably already familiar with Usnia too. Um, Avernia prunastria, I mentioned this one earlier, but it's worth uh, mentioning again. The common name for this one is oak moss, and uh, you'll find this on oaks and other hardwoods. One thing that's cool about this species is it branches annually, so you can tell how old it is by counting the number of branches from the base to the tip of a lobe. And this is actually the world's most economically important lichen. A fixative that's used to make perfumes um, is uh, extracted from this lichen. So it's harvested in really large amounts in Europe. And it's what we think of as kind of like a weedy lichen. It's pretty fast growing and it's relatively disturbance tolerant. So it's, it's probably a good choice for uh, being the world's most economically important lichen. And feel free to let me know if there are any questions as we go to. Hi, this is Ira. I do have a question. Sure. Can you go back to the previous one, the um, Avernia? Yeah. yeah. So what, did you say the common name was oak moss for this one? Yeah, so kind of confusing because okay. it's not a moss, obviously. But Okay, so is there another common name or? I'm just thinking like because I'm an interpreter and so if I'm pointing something out, I want, I mean, I could use a scientific name, but my audience always is not that science, like. We don't um, you know, I encourage people to just ruthlessly make up common names when you don't okay. like the existing <laughs> ones. So uh, you could call it oak lichen, you know, that would be okay. Okay. Or you could call it perfume lichen, you know. Okay. Yeah, you know, common names, there's no one in charge of common names. You know, we have this like International Botanical Congress that runs the Latin names and makes rules, but there's nothing like that for common names. So you can call things whatever you want. And okay. the, yeah, I find, you know, people will believe you if you tell them a common name that you just made up. It's amazing. Yeah, who knows? Maybe I'm making up all of this, you know? No, I'm just kidding. I'm <laughs> okay, thank you. And the other thing, uh, so, while we're talking about Avernia, the other distinctive thing is it's this kind of uh, greenish, yellowish, grayish color on top, and it's totally white on the underside. So that's the key feature for distinguishing Avernia. There's nothing else that looks that's this shape and has the two distinctive colors on the top and bottom. So this is the top in the center, um, upper center here, and this is the bottom in the upper right. It's, the difference is more distinctive in real life than in this photo. Um, so I, I, oh, go uh, ahead, yeah. This is reminding me while we were talking about um, scientific names, there was a question earlier, which was, um, is the scientific name based on both, both uh, like the fungal and photosynthesizing partner, or is it, you know, based on one or the other? Yeah, great question. Um, so the scientific name is actually based on the fungal partner. So the name we're saying when we say hypogymnia, that's the name of the fungal partner. Um, in the, and part of the reason for that is because there are only like 50 algae, um, you know, there's a lot more diversity in the fungus. So basically everything that looks like a different lichen is a different lichen fungus, with a few possible exceptions. So the hypogymnias are what we call the tube lichens. Um, we have several species of these in California too, and the thing that makes them distinctive is they're hollow, um, or what we can call inflated. Um, so you basically, you can break the lobe open and there's empty space inside the lobe. Uh, so that's why we call it tube lichen. And um, these grow in a pretty wide range of habitats. You'll find them in, you know, pretty wet rainforests um, and also drier forests. Um, usually, I think usually on conifers, I'm having trouble picturing. Oh no, I can think of places I've seen them on hardwoods too. Anyway, pretty distinctive. You can learn to recognize these pretty easily. Um, and sometimes the color of the inside of the lobe is important for figuring out which species it is. But mostly I'm just focusing on helping you recognize some genera here. Another really abundant genus in California is Fisconia. These are very small lichens. Everything else I've talked about is somewhat um, decent sized. 
these are like the size of, you know, maybe a quarter at the biggest, maybe, and you know, you might find ones that are more like the size of a dime. Um, we have a handful of species. Um, one thing that's distinctive is they have these uh, rhizines or the root-like structures underneath that are super branched. Um, yeah, anyway, these are perhaps uh, not the best total beginner lichen, but once you start keying into them, they're on like lots and lots of oak trees in California. Like they're just everywhere. Little, little gray stuff on oak trees, uh, sometimes greenish colored when they're wet, sometimes uh, other like brownish green colors. And then this is a really distinctive group. Um, I imagine many of you have seen this before, uh, the wolf lichens, Lotharia. Um, we have just a handful of species, but they're all this bright chartreuse color. Uh, and they become abundant in drier habitats in California. You don't get them in really wet places, but they've become very abundant in the Sierra Nevada. Uh, you know, like every red fir tree in the Sierra Nevada is covered in wolf lichen and lots, lots of other trees in the Sierra too. Um, and you, you will get them in the coast ranges here and there, but um, they're, a lot, they're typically more abundant in the Sierra, the Modoc Plateau, um, other dry places. Um, fun fact, it's called wolf lichen because it's uh, poisonous and it was supposedly used to kill wolves in Scandinavia back in the day. I don't know how, uh, if that's ver completely verified or not, um, but it's definitely something to be ca cautious of. Um, it's fine to touch wolf lichen, but you shouldn't, yeah, you shouldn't eat it. Yeah, pro tip, don't eat poisonous things. And you know, the color, the color is a good sign. It's saying, watch out, I'm wolf lichen, be afraid. Um, and another lichen with the same chemical uh, that gives it the same color is, um, oh, I'm trying to remember the common name. Uh, or this has, it's a great common name. It's uh, brown-eyed sunshine, uh, Vulpicida canadensis. Uh, also grows in these drier habitats. You'll, around here, you'll actually see it on gray pine a lot. That's the main uh, tree I see it grow on in the Bay Area, um, also known as ghost pine. Um, really cool little lichen, also equally poisonous because it has the same chemical that makes it um, this bright chartreuse color. Um, a cool group of lichens uh, that you'll find in wet places, uh, often perhaps on conifers too, but also on hardwoods, is the kidney lichens or nephromas. And they're distinctive because they have these little apothecia that are on the underside of their lobes. So this is looking up. Um, and the apothecia are kind of kidney shaped, so hence the uh, named nephroma, which is, um, uh, you know, nephrons are the, nef nef the root is a, a word for kidney in Latin or Greek, I can't remember. Um, and you'll often find these in kind of high quality old growth forests, um, and there are a handful of species too. And if there are any more questions, just uh, let me know as we go. Yeah, we do have a couple questions. Um... So one that came up more than once now is actually, um, are, are lichens edible? Are there some that, that people can eat? Yeah, great question. Um, so there, yeah, so there's one main species of lichen that's been traditionally eaten in North America called uh, Briaria or uh, hair lichen. These are the brown um, hair-like lichens that you see uh, in drier places like in the Sierra Nevada. Also up in the mountains, you'll sometimes see them. Uh, like even in wetter mountains. Um, but yeah, they were traditionally uh, an important food source uh, for indigenous people in California and are probably still eaten to some extent. Um, they, yeah, they would take big masses of briaria and cook them down in pit ovens to make these jelly, kind of gelatinous cakes. Um, that's the only really good example I know of here, but supposedly uh, in the Bible, when it talks about manna from heaven, uh, that's actually referring to vagrant lichens that, blow, that aren't attached to a substrate, but blow around in the wind. And supposedly manna from heaven was actually when these tides of vagrant lichens would roll into a village and people could collect them and eat them during times of starvation. So yeah, in general, I'd say, uh, you know, not hugely important overall as a food source compared to everything else we can do with lichens though. Was, that, was there anything else? Yeah, another question. Um, do hypogymnia often have a black underside and are there other species or, or groups that could be defined by that as well? Um, you know, hypogymnia can have a black underside, but there are other ones, there are other species that can too. So yeah, for hypogymnia, what you really want to key into is the hollow lobes, the hollow tube-like lobes. 
I, there's I, uh, almost nothing else that does that. Mm -hmm. I can't figure out the chat thing, so I'm just unmuting. <laughs> have, I, have I, in fact, seen, you know, some crustose uh, lichens are very thin crusts. You know, it's like almost like they've been painted on. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And have I seen, is it like, and I'm seeing down at the beach, looking up at these rocks that have these highly colored surfaces? Quite, yeah, quite possibly. Yep. Sounds like it. Yeah. Like okay. you, you, crustose lichens can be really, um, pretty diverse range of different colors. Because that, well, that would be in a specific environment of a lot of sea brine and uh, wet and then dry, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and there's, there, I think there's some lichens that may even um, have adaptations to kind of like tolerate the salt spray in particular. Okay. I'm not totally sure about that, but I feel like I've heard that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I think we just have a couple more species or genera to go over here. We'll get this, we're running out of time, of course. Um, it's just so hard. There's so much to talk about with lichens. Um, one of my personal favorite genera is the genus Sticta. Um, part of why these are cool is because you often find them in old growth forests. We have a handful of species, and the thing that's distinctive about Sticta, they're folios lichens, leaf-like lichens, but they um, always have these big um, white craters in the underside of them. Um, very distinctive um, when you see them. Uh, you, there's also, you'll sometimes find these on shrubs too, like on Mount Vision at Point Reyes. Um, I believe there are one or two species of Sticta that you'll find on the uh, Baccarus, the uh, coyote brush up there. Uh, super cool stuff. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say about Sticta. Another big genus that we have a lot of uh, species of is Peltigera or dog lichens. And these most commonly grow on soil. Um, they can be gray or they can be green. So some have a cyanobacterial partner, those are the gray ones. Some have a photosynthesizing partner, those are the green ones. And the distinctive things about the Peltigera is they have these veins on the underside. Um, there's really nothing else with those veins. So that's really the uh, distinctive thing. Um, one more, I'll, I'll, I'll quit with this one. One more uh, really distinctive and cool genus is Umbilicaria. Um, these are lichens that grow on rocks and they're called Umbilicaria because they have what's called an umbilicus. So they're just attached to the rock at a single um, central point called a holdfast. So here are some uh, upside down Umbilicarias. You can see that white spot is the uh, holdfast, the place where it's attached. Um, but yeah, there's actually this really cool red species that we get in Northern California. They can be kind of whitish, grayish. Um, anyway, you'll see rocks that are just covered in these things and they're actually pretty distinctive. There's not much else that, um, looks like them once you get to recognize them. So anyway, these are just a few of the groups of lichens, uh, that you're likely to encounter. This is certainly not everything, but if you, um, you know, learn to recognize these 10 lichens or whatever it is I've covered here. Um, you're going to be able to go out and recognize a lot of stuff um, everywhere you go in California. And then, you know, if you want to, you can start figuring out how to identify the species within each of these groups too. So I'm wondering if we should just briefly, I don't think we'll have time to do a full keying exercise, but we could just briefly look at the key so I could explain how that works. So it seemed like a good plan. So I think everyone um, was emailed the Tom Carlberg's key to macro lichen genera. So if you want to pull that up, I'll go ahead and share, um, do a screen share for my PDF of it. And I'll just give you a quick tour for how it works. Um, Tom was very generous to uh, share this with us. So Tom um, lives in Humboldt County. He's one of California's very best lichenologists, super experienced. Um, and he just asked that you, um, contact him before distributing this key if you want to pass it on to anyone. And he also appreciates comments from anyone that uses it. It's a work in progress. You can see it says draft on it. Um, so he, uh, you know, likes to get feedback on it and keep improving it. And this is probably the best single resource for identifying lichens in Northern California, partly because it's just uh, very simple. Um, well, <laughs> it's all relative. It's relatively simple and straightforward. Um, 
So for anyone who's never used a dichotomous key before, the way it works is it's like playing a game of 20 questions. Uh, the key asks you to choose between two choices, and then depending on what you choose, you, get, you uh, end up uh, with another set of questions, and you continue like this until you actually get to um, identifying the lichen. Uh, so the first part of the key is this key to groups. And so the first thing it asks you is, is the fruiting body mushroom-like um, or is the fruiting body not mushroom-like? And uh, for almost all of our lichens in Northern California, the answer is gonna be not mushroom-like. We just have a few very rare species that we call basidio lichens that actually have um, these mushroom-like fruiting bodies. Uh, so we're not gonna deal with those today. Um, but then we can go on down. So we pick not mushroom-like and we go to the next break and uh, then the question is between the gelatinous or jelly lichens and the stratified lichens, um, which we talked about. Um, and so to, to really fully make all of these decisions, you have to read the full break and think about um, whether any of those things apply. And I, I just, you know, since we're almost out of time, I'm going to keep this quick. Anyway, you can continue through this and um, see that this key to groups just, um, there are just a few possible options you can end up with here like the fruticose lichens, the umbilicate lichens, like the umbilicaria we just talked about, um, the cyanobacterial foliose lichens, and the stratified foliose green algal lichens. Um, anyway, each of these is associated with another key on the following pages. Um, and when you get to those, um, when you get to one of these keys, um, you'll end up at an actual genus. And this key doesn't go beyond the genus level. So it's not gonna get you to species, um, but it should help you figure out the genera of any macro lichens. So this doesn't include crustose lichens. So you can't key out crusts with this. Crusts are a lot more challenging to identify, but you should be able to identify any foliose or fruticose uh, macro lichen genus, uh, genus. So the macro lichens are the fruticose and foliose lichens. Um, so we're almost out of time. Um, if anyone has more questions about the key or anything else, I'd be happy to talk about it though. Hi, this is Irma again. I'll show my video. Um, All right. I'm not talking to a black square here. Um, hi, I was wondering, Jesse, if you wouldn't mind sharing like three to four facts of why lichens are important to us. Um, you did mention that, you know, you can tell that there's a lot of nitrogen in certain areas based on the lichens that grow. And it's so funny because you were talking about that. And I picked up this little branch in the parking lot of our, our office and we're right next to the highway. So it's like super bright and orange. That nitrogen. There you go. Yeah. So, but, um, so that's one thing that, so it's kind of an indicator species of high, high concentrations of nitrogen, which is poor air quality. But what other like two or three things do you think it's important for people to know about lichens? I mean, obviously we're all a little nature-esque focused. Like I totally geek out on lichens. I think they're beautiful, but I want it to be relative. Like why, why else are they important to us? Sure, yeah. Well, I mean, I think one thing is just the diversity of animals that eat them. One thing I've learned is people always care more about stuff if animal, if it involves animals. Yeah, it's, you know, it's hard for us plant people. People are like, oh, that's a cool plant. What eats it, you know? So uh, I, I always like to fall back on the fact that a lot of animals depend on lichens if, mm -hmm. uh, if people can't get about, excited about the lichens for their own sake. Uh -huh. um, and one, one of my favorite examples is actually that several birds line their nests with lichens or build their nests entirely out of lichens. Uh, lichens contain all these antimicrobial chemicals and it actually creates a little like um, antibiotic environment for their babies to grow in because it keeps like um, the babies from getting fungal infections. So that's, that's kind of a fun one. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, so basically uh -huh. they contribute to healthy ecosystems and if you have a health, what's, you know, what's good for our environment is good for humans too. So if we're seeing that there's these animal populations are doing well, that means that our ecosystems around us are healthy. Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, do we have other questions? What, one more question here. Um, regardless of how they're attaching to a substrate, if they are, how are they attaching? Is it a chemical bond? Is it a, uh, 
how do they attach to their substrates? You know, that's a good question. Um, there's some lichens that are actually like not completely attached, like lace lichen mm -hmm. is often just kind of draped in the tree, but it's not necessarily like attached at any given point. But mm -hmm. yeah, there are a lot of lichens that are truly attached. You know, I my guess is the fungal hyphae just kind of weave their way into the substrate um, and kind of just hold on to it. Um, like, you know, for the bark of a tree, they kind of weave their way into the little um, craters in the bark. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's, yeah, you know, I've never really thought about that. That's a great question. I don't, I don't have a full answer for that. But well, uh, yeah, that's, that's something to think about. Thanks. Mm hmm Oh, and oh. let me, since we are going to wrap, and we can keep taking questions. I'm just going to put up my contact info um, as we wrap things up here. Um, I do, I often lead, uh, you know, like real life lichen walks when there aren't plagues going on. So um, I'll just put up my contact info. And if you wanna, um, if you send me an email, if you'd like to be on my mailing list, I can um, let you know if I end up doing some lichen walks, um, you know, once we're, once we're able to meet in person again in the future. Since, you know, it's obviously a different experience to actually be out there and looking at lichens together versus uh, just doing it over Zoom. Um, so feel free to, yeah, there's my website, my email, my Twitter, uh, feel free to stay in touch. It's always fun to have new lichen friends. So, uh, um, you know, I hope to, and, and since we are wrapping up here, I'll, I'll stick around and keep answering questions. But um, for those of you who are going to take off, I just want to say uh, I wish you the best in your lichen journey. And I hope you'll uh, continue to see cool lichens all around you. Um, you know, once you start looking, they're everywhere. And uh, yeah, I hope I'll get to cross paths with some of you again in the future, uh, maybe in real life. And stay in touch if you want to uh, hear about future lichen walks and other events. Um, I try to do these things a couple times a year normally, but who knows? Um, I'm hopeful we'll be able to do it sooner rather than later since it seems like outdoor activities are relatively safe. Um, so yeah, you know, maybe, maybe sometime later this year or next year we'll be able to at least go back in the field, at least in small groups. So anyway, thanks everyone. This has been really fun and I'll uh, stay on as long as people want to keep asking questions.